Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Cannabis Investor Roundtable here at the Cannabis Society MSO Growth and Consolidation Conference. Uh, I am pleased to present to you uh, our next set of panelists, but I will hand that over to our moderator, Lisa uh, from Zuber Law, who will uh, take it from here and run the panel for us. So, Lisa, over to you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, we've got um, uh, Ian Sloan here. He's president of Sloan Capital uh, LLC. It's a family office in New York targeting hedge funds and private equity funds, uh, operating businesses, and listed securities. We've also got Tyler Grief from, he's the managing director and portfolio manager of Poseidon Partners, which is the longest running institutional investors in cannabis. It started in 2014 and they invest in seed stage um, companies all the way through a publicly traded stage. Um, we've got Jeffrey Howard. He's the managing partner of Salveo Capital, which is also a long running uh, company. Invest, they invest in a variety of cultivations, dispensaries, ancillary products, software and technology companies across the country. And we've also got Matt Norgram, who is the founding and managing partner of Arcadian Capital. It's a venture capital uh, firm headquartered in Los Angeles, and they manage investment vehicles and um, ancillary products. And he's running a little late, but he'll be joining us soon. And I'm an attorney with Zuber Lawler, which is a cannabis, um, well, they uh, we uh, work in all kinds of emerging industries and technologies, but a lot of cannabis work, I work, um, mergers and acquisitions, all types of deals um, across the uh, country. Um, but the firm is based in California, and we have offices in New York, Chicago, Denver, Phoenix, and I'm in Austin, Texas, so I'm starting the Texas and Southern footprint. So let's get started. I'm going to kind of ask a lot of y'all sort of the same questions, and we can uh, just sort of jump in. We'll start with Ian. Um, how how did you get involved in the cannabis industry, and how long have you been involved, and, and why were you attracted to it? Oh, God, that's multi-pronged multi answer. Um got involved about five years ago when uh, cannabis became legal in Canada um, and started looking at the Canadian companies and got involved with one of the uh, leading Canadian companies at a relatively early stage. And then when cannabis started becoming more um, uh, legalized state by state in the United States, we started investing in, in, um, in some of the the, the um, private equity funds, did some side-by-side -side investments in private equity, and then a range of the other sort of normal investments that you make in the cannabis industries. We have public, public uh, stocks and uh, other investments. Um, why, what attracts, what's attractive about the industry, uh, just like every industry, there are pros and cons. Um, the first one, I think most importantly, is that we know that a market exists. That's not very common for new industries. And the challenge is just trans uh, transiting demand or uh, transitioning demand is a better word um, to from an illegal to a legal market. Secondly, the structure of the industry as it sits today, you know, in individual states, limited licensing creates an oligopolistic uh, environment which gives which pro which gives the opportunity for um, excess profits relative to other industries um, third is uh, while it's not scientifically proven there's a lot of um, anecdotal evidence that the plant has health benefits and for three I think there's a unique opportunity in the cannabis to be a force for social improvement for the underrepresented minorities and those places where um, the war on drugs was most um, uh, negatively, had the most negative effect. Uh, but there's some negatives as well. You know, the taxation regime uh, doesn't make life easy um, in certainly in after tax profits. And that together with municipal and other taxes makes prices high for consumers and therefore slows and makes more difficult the transition to the legal market. I think, I think uh, one can't deny that much like other products, like alcohol, nicotine, pharmaceuticals, even food, there's a potential for abuse 
and addiction, which one needs to be careful. And I think there's residual stigma uh, for people involved, social stigma for people involved in the industry. That might not be a negative, it might be a positive because it lessens the competition. Tyler, what do you have to add to that on behalf of Poseidon having been involved in this since the beginning of recreational uh, legalization? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, look, my background is as a, an investor for about 21 years in multiple different industries. I worked at a hedge fund for a little, a little while, um, got into the energy industry. And then about three years ago, I met Morgan and Emily Paxia, uh, who are the founders of Poseidon, and really started learning about the intricacies and opportunities uh, available uh, in the cannabis sector. And um, you know, your original question was, you know, why did we get involved in the cannabis and hemp sector? And um, you know, to me, this is a generation generational opportunity. Um, there's only so many times where you can really get in at the beginning uh, of 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 a, of a industry like this. Um, and I think that what you're going to see over time is a lot of the, the regulations that are holding back the industry, whether it be 280E or, um, you know, uh, restrictions on listings, um, ultimately will uh, alleviate themselves. And I think that that is um, really put a, um, you know, I guess I'll say speed bumps um, to companies really being able to realize their full potential valuations. Um, but you're seeing tremendous growth, growth rates, very, very solid um, cash flow margins. And, um, you know, we see valuations which are at a discount to other types of comparable companies. So to me, this is just an incredibly uh, attractive industry to be a part of. Uh, it's very exciting. And along with some of the, some of the points that Ian made, um, I completely agree with. And, um, you know, just very excited to be part of this 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 wave here. And Jeffrey uh, Salveo Capital invests across a broad uh, cross section of companies across the country. Um, what what's your perspective on uh, investing in the cannabis sector? Yeah, thank you, Lisa, and uh, for moderating. And thank you, uh, the Cannabis uh, Society, for putting this together. Um, it's an exciting time in the cannabis industry. Um, I got involved, uh, well, I, I, I had a Wall Street career. And then in 2014, 15, I started poking around the cannabis space. Uh, that's, you know, when Colorado and Washington State had gone legal in 2012, I guess it was. Um, and, so, and so I figured that that was going to spread. It was going to be a state-by-state -state, uh, legalization uh, uh, effort for, for the next couple of years. And so uh, after looking around in the space, uh, you know, it, it, back then and even still to this day, you know, it still is a fairly, you know, fragmented, inefficient market just based on how it's grown state by state, different regulations, medical versus rec. And so, you know, back then, I, I know me personally, I love I love fragmented, inefficient markets. Uh, if if you believe in the growth story, uh, and so if you believed in 2014, the cannabis industry was going to be bigger in 2015, 16, 17, uh, because of the the infancy of the industry back then, uh, the you know the 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 what we noticed at Salveo when we put Salveo to, uh, together you know, a venture capital fund in 2016 to make investments, you know, back then and even still to this day, because of all of those fragmentation, inefficient markets, you know, nascent industry, regulatory uncertainty, you know, valuations were artificially low back then. And so to Tyler's point, you know, if you believe in this once in a generational opportunity and you see the opportunity, you're, you're at the beginning of the growth story in a very fragmented, inefficient uh, industry that has, you know, artificially low, um, valuations, you know, that that's a phenomenal investment environment. And so and so we put the fund together in 2016. And so from 2016 until today, uh, we've been we've been a very, very active investor in the space across, like you mentioned before, ancillary, uh, non plant touching can cannabis tech, SaaS, uh, all the way through cannabis brands, and then all the way through MSOs and, and SSOs. So so the market certainly evolved. The next phase of the growth story, uh, I'm sure, which we'll talk about, is um, 
is when is when not even legalization, but when these companies are able to list in the U.S. Uh, you know, um, you know, uplist. Uh, that, that, then that's you know that's the next phase. But um, but thank you. Lisa, Lisa, you're on mute. Whoops. So my next couple of questions are going to be what what types of investments have you made and, and what's your current activity and focus? So, um, Jeffrey, why don't you um, start with with that? Yeah. So for Salveo, you know, like I said, that we met, we started the fund in 2016. Um, you know, back then, obviously, you know, clearly more regulatory uncertainty even then than now. Um, and so we were a little bit gun shy uh, and very conservative. And so we started out with a strategy specifically of ancillary non-plant touching. Back then, Jeff Sessions was the attorney general. It was unclear. He pulled the coal memo. And so we stayed away from plant touching uh, investments. And uh, and so we have a handful, you know, upwards of nine or ten non-plant touching. So data analytics companies, uh, point of sale companies, uh, 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 CRM companies, um, and so and so and so we have a handful of those companies that we started with. And then as as the industry evolved, and, and we realized there was going to be no good or bad federal action, uh, action at the federal level, we got comfortable, more comfortable with plant touching. We moved into plant touching brands. And so we made an investment, may have a couple investments, uh, Colorado brands, California brands. Uh, we did make an early investment in a Canadian brand, which we've exited since. And then as, again, as, as these companies started listing in 2018 uh, on, on Canadian Securities Exchange and you know, uh, mostly MSOs, uh, are all MSOs for the most part back then. Uh, and there was a path to liquidity and there was a path to more capital. Then we got uh, uh, excited about making investments in, in MSOs, multi-state operators, and SSOs, single state operators. So, so we have a portfolio of 21 companies in the industry that runs the gamut, including uh, a, a, a woman's brand and uh, uh, CBD DTC uh, company. Uh, but now, but now, primarily, uh, you know, we'll, we're, we're looking at all sorts of investments. We look again. We continue to see a tremendous amount of deal flow and great deal flow within the industry. But just you ask, what our most recent investments have been? Our most recent investments have been in MSOs, um, and and we still think, uh, you know, even the pub, some of the public MSOs are are, are just wildly discounted. Uh, so so we're excited about some of some of the MSOs. Are these your favorite? Horses so, to bet on, or, or, or do the well, horses in the race? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, there's very few, you know, you know, good uh, M private MSOs uh, left for the most part. Um, but I will say, you have some public MSOs, you know, from a, from an EV EBITDA multiple like an Ayer. I mean, an Ayer is trading at like six and a half times 2022. Uh, revenue. So, so you know, the, the gamut of tier one MSOs ranges, I think, from somewhere between like 25 times to where AIR is at like six and a half times. And so, you know, single digit multiples in this industry, as fast as it's growing, is just wildly cheap. And so, so, so there's a couple of public MSOs we like. And then again, we um, we're always looking at private private companies as well. We just MSOs that trains kind of left the station, but we do we also are looking at and have made some investments in still like SSOs, single state operators. That 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 segment is still yet to to consolidate uh, as quickly as the MSO space did. Ian, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Jeffrey, you're in actually investing in the public markets with your fund. May I just ask? Sorry. Uh, we, 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 we have some public market. Oh, excellent. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we're in, uh, we're uh, invested across the gamut and we com uh, and we, um, and we continue to look at opportunities, but most importantly, um, I, I've uh, collected with a bunch of investors. We call ourselves Enzo Sciences. Uh, we spent the last two years collecting together a team of what we, I think we, we are, we're trying to mix operational capability with our investment op op uh, um, capabilities. And therefore we've um, 
uh, we've we've um, uh, spent time building up a team of both investors from Wall Street, investors like myself, and operators, large scale operators, um, to build an institutional capability. And we're um, in, we're looking at sort of four paths. Um, uh, we're looking at virgin licensing and are currently in the process of looking at uh, applying for licenses in New Jersey and New York. We, uh, we have significant capital behind us, so we think we can apply our capital and our operational expertise uh, in joint ventures or in acquisitions or investments in single state operators or in distressed opportunities. The team comprises of financial guys, as I said, from Wall Street, but also significant operating people. Uh, one of our partners is one of the largest traditional ag uh, operators in the United States with 7 million plus um, square feet of cultivation under glass. And we have some PhDs, uh, plant genetics, um, uh, working on hybridized, standard hybridized, F1 standard hybridized seeds. Um, and we have people in each of the segments of the value chain uh, where we can apply our skills and our capital uh, to be helpful. Great. Um, and Tyler, it's, it's been my perception that Poseidon's got a very tailored and strategic investment uh, strategy. Could you explain that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have traditionally invested you know, from seed stage all the way through to the, you know, to publicly traded companies. Um, and some of those publicly traded companies we got involved with uh, at the seed stage. So um, we will do um, public or private investments. Um, so we currently manage a portfolio that includes uh, some of both. Um, probably have, you know, since inception, Poseidon has probably invested in over 60 to 70 different companies in the space. And on some of those um, investments, um, principles of Poseidon serve as um, directors of the board. Um, so at, at times we do get involved uh, from that perspective in, 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 the, in the companies in our portfolio. Um, so, you know, in terms of what types of companies, um, I mean, it, it ranges from MSOs to ancillary types of businesses, data collection, uh, and so on. So it, it really runs the gamut in terms of the type of business, both public and private. Uh, generally speaking, it's predominantly United States based, but um, we do have investments throughout North, of North America. Uh, and so, you know, we, um, we, we run a diversified portfolio and um, yeah, that's, that's, that's um, pretty much how we um, look at the investments. All right. Well, welcome, Matt. We have been kind of going over how you got involved in cannabis, how long you've been involved, what types of investments you've made, and, and what your current activity and focus is, if you want to catch up and, and um, jump into all that. Okay, Lisa. Hey, glad to be here. <laughs> um, big fan of Zuber Lawler. You guys have done some great work for us, and you do it the right way. Hello to the friends out there, Jeff in particular. Tyler just got off the phone with Emily. That wasn't the reason I was late, but we were solving a fire, which is what we do together. Glad to be here with this team. I'm the founder uh, and a managing partner over at Arcadian Capital. Uh, we have about 51 companies and um, uh, we're really a growth equity investor. We have Arcadian Europe out of London, Arcadian Mexico out of Mexico City, focused on Latin America and our corporate offices in LA and Los Angeles. And so uh, I got into this space, it was a calling. I don't know. I mean, you only are where you are in life. And at that particular time, the stars aligned. And, uh, you know, I believe in the spirit. I believe in God. And it was, a, it was a, a very clear sign at the time. And here we are today. I think we're all pretty happy we're in it. But uh, sorry to be a little behind. And um, uh, just glad to be a part of the panel. Hope we can share something that's helpful to folks listening. Yeah, so what types of investments have you made and, and uh, what's your current activity and focus? Well, that's a broad uh, question. We have about 51 companies throughout the entire supply chain. We don't do public deals. Uh, in the early days, uh, Jeff, you might agree, it feels like dog years. Uh, but in those days, we were doing, you know, sort of venture -y 
real venture work. But I think at this time, um, unless you're on the B2C side, unless you're really focused on the consumer, because without the rules in place, uh, the consumer doesn't even know what's coming for them and the rules haven't allowed them to do so. So I think you can be very venture on the consumer aspect. But, you know, as Jeff mentioned, if you're if you're looking at the sort of um, fundamental assets that the industry needs to thrive, the retail cultivation manufacturing uh, licensed assets, those probably are all out there for sure. And they're probably all public, frankly. Um, although the West Coast is making a case right now. I think you're seeing a line drawn in the sand. As you mentioned, AYR, you know, things happening with glass house. Glass houses decided not just to sell their building. And um, you're looking at California representing, I don't know, 25 to 32 percent of the of the revenue that's out there. At some point, these East Coast MSOs are going to have to have that for the story. And so I think when you look at that part of the industry, you're probably playing pu public market or, as Jeff said, single state operators. Um, there's good equity left, but the reality is you might as well protect your downside with some credit in those types of strategies. And so uh, we look at the B2B side is late stage growth equity. If you're servicing this great industry, uh, you feel like those companies haven't achieved their highest multiples, things like data, software, HR, compliance, packaging, media, bottling. And, and you have to believe that that day is coming pretty soon because in many ways, those aren't illegal companies. And at the same time, um, with midterms approaching, one could believe that we may get those 60 votes given the states that have changed. And so I think on the B2B side, you know, you may think late stage equity potentially. Um, and then on the B2C side, I think your early stage equity. This is America, obviously. Europe, a lot of time to evolve. Mexico, moving a little bit slow. Uh, other markets have a different rationale behind them. But in the U.S., I would say that's probably generally the three categories and how to think about them. Well, it kind of leads to our, our next part. We're going to kind of start to conclude here and ask you to get out your crystal balls and magic eight balls. Um, there's been a lot of talk about federal legalization, which might be kind of down the line, but what's your view on that and how how the industry and regulation should evolve when that might happen? Who would like to jump in and take that on first? Uh, oh, sure. Jeffrey. Don't jump, everybody. <laughs> I'll jump on the grenade on that one. But uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I think, uh, so my, 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 this is just my personal view. I, I think, I think, I think legalization is, is unfortunately a bit out there. I think the Schumer, you know, bill was a, was a dud. Uh, but, but so I, I, I don't think, I, I personally don't think we're going to see, you know, full out legalization um, b before the midterms. But what I do think, I do think we will get the, the, um, Safe Banking Act passed. I do think it'll have safe harbor language uh, for these companies that are, are currently trading OTC to uplist and NYSE and NASDAQ. Uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm extremely bullish on that. And I don't think you need federal legalization for this industry to continue to grow at the pace it is. It's a state by state story now. Once you have, you know, uplisting, uh, you know, it's just going to have the whole entire industry is going to re-rate because it's going to have a liquidity premium at that point. So so I don't think federal legalization in the near term. I do think safe banking in the near term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, 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 um, I actually I'm actually for, for delaying federal legalization if it means uh, interstate commerce. I think there's a model that you can have federal legalization uh, but excluding interstate commerce or at least delaying it for the next five to ten years because this is a very young industry and particularly for the farming community outside of the Sunbelt states and the social equity entrepreneurs that several states are, are encouraging to enter into the industry they need time to develop themselves and to grow and to stabilize and that takes a long time and if interstate commerce uh, comes too quickly, we risk too rapid consolidation of the industry and uh, into too few hands, and we will uh, do less well, 
uh, in achieving the potential social gains, which I think the cannabis industry offers another unique opportunity to try and help um, uh, disenfranchised um, um, people in the United States. So I'd love to see sort of the relaxation of 280E, which would be great, including the SAFE Act, which which I agree with completely. Mm -hmm. So you get normal access to normal banking and capital sources. Mm -hmm. I think you need necessarily but lighter regulations mm -hmm. similar to other consumer food products and regulations that prevent the concentration of, nas mm -hmm. of, um, of national distribution into too few companies um, mm -hmm. that has occurred in the, uh, in the liquor business. Absolutely. Um, Tyler? Sure. And I'll go quick here. I know we're coming up on time, but, you know, I'd agree with Ian and Jeffrey. And I think that I think federal legalization is further out than um, than 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 we than we would imagine. I think that people within the industry uh, probably uh, have an incentive to um, see it further out as well, because with federal legalization comes international trade, um, yeah. which might have some adverse effects on some domestic players. Um, and um, so I do see, I see safe banking and I see hopefully, um, you know, lifting the restrictions of 280E uh, as well. But, um, but, you know, federal legalization out at least several years in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree. How about uh, Matthew? All great points. Everybody, I think we're on the same page with this one. It's midterms. You really have to wait and see the result of that particular situation. Um, but uh, the only thing I'd add is that uh, to echo Ian's uh, sentiment is that it's got to be done right. It's got to be done right. And I don't think that anybody in this industry who actually cares about it um, is more incentivized uh, economically than by impact. And, um, you know, at this stage of our lives, impact is just uh, everything. And, and we have a real opportunity uh, to build an industry the right way from the beginning, while the rest seem to try to be reverse engineering and fixing the way things were for so long. We have a unique opportunity to build a very big one the way it should and consider all the things that need to be considered. So as long as it gets, as it gets done the right way, I think everybody in this room and hopefully those participating uh, will feel comfortable with the ultimate result. Yeah. I, I often talk about, you know, eventually we're going to get to the Coors and Budweiser of, of marijuana. Um, and that means not just a concentration of a few companies, but also these other companies like tobacco and alcohol are going to have major investment interest in them too, which I think also has implications that also touches on factors that every one of you have mentioned. And it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting. I, I thank all of you for your very valuable perspectives on all of these topics today. I think everyone will very uh, much appreciate hearing them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun thank to you be very here. much, Lisa, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we will. We do have to move on with our next panel, which is ask Jushi anything about their consolidation strategy. Uh, so we're just going to take a quick two minute to turn around, and I'll see you over in that panel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.